Thanks for attending today's program, Managing the Emotional Toll of Cancer. I'm Judy Chandler, Director of Partnerships at Inspire, and will be moderating today's program. I'd like to begin by thanking our speakers, Dr. Elizabeth Harvey and Allie Schaefer, and our co-sponsors, Fight Colorectal Cancer and Debbie's Dream Foundation Curing Stomach Cancer. To give you a little background, Fight CRC is the leading national colorectal cancer nonprofit advocacy group. They offer support for patients and caregivers and serve as a resource for advocates, policymakers, and medical professionals. Fight CRC leads efforts to increase and improve research for colorectal cancer for all stagers, stages and throughout the cancer continuum. Our other program partner for today is Debbie's Dream Foundation Curing Stomach Cancer. They are a 501c3 nonprofit organization dedicated to raising awareness about stomach cancer, advancing funding for research, and providing education and support to families, patients, and caregivers. Their ultimate goal is to make the cure for stomach cancer reality. To go over a few housekeeping items before we begin, we are recording the webinar today so that those who are unable to attend can watch an archived version of the program later. We will be emailing a recording of the program out to everyone later this week. We'll also be taking questions at the end of the program after both speakers are finished with their presentations. Please submit your questions at any time during the program using the questions section on your control panel. Please also let us know which speaker your question is for and try to be as general as possible since we cannot provide individual medical information or advice. Also, if you're having any technical issues, feel free to use the questions function to let us know. Our first speaker today is Dr. Elizabeth Harvey, whose career spans over 40 years of experience in academic, government, and industry sectors of cancer research. Her passion for the welfare of cancer patients drew her to the field of psycho-oncology. Dr. Harvey is a research affiliate at Sloan Kettering in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences and is a practicing psycho-oncologist in the New York City area where she helps cancer patients, their families, and caregivers across the cancer continuum. Thank you, Dr. Harvey, for joining us today. Okay. Um, hello, everyone. I am so delighted to be here today to talk about the emotional experience of the person living with cancer. Once you're diagnosed with this disease, your life is just turned upside down, and coping can be very difficult. I hope that by sharing with you what I have learned through my training and practice as a psycho-oncologist, that you and your loved ones and caregivers can better understand the reactions to having cancer, which will help you cope and to realize if and when perhaps professional support could be helpful. As I mentioned, I'm a psycho-oncologist. Well, what is that? Psycho-oncologist is a multidisciplinary field that meets the emotional needs of cancer patients. And it's made up of any one who touches any a patient or a caregiver or loved ones with cancer. They're psychologists, chaplains, mental health counselors, oncologists, behavioral specialists, etc. who are devoted to the psychology and social care of patients and their families at all stages of cancer. And before I start talking about the emotional experience, I just want to give you a little bit of a history of how people began to recognize these emotional patterns and how important it is to support the emotional side of the cancer patients as well as the treatment side. So the interest stems from the fact that in 2015 alone there were over a million and a half new cases of cancer, over, over 500,000 deaths. That's 1,500 deaths a day, and that's a quarter of the deaths in the U.S. from cancer, second only to cardiovascular disease. And it's actually projected that by the year 2050 that cancer incidence and mortality is going to almost double worldwide. So 
the diagnosis and treatment of cancer, is, as I said, is a major life stress for the person with cancer and their families. It presents psychological difficulties, anxiety, depression, relationship strain, etc., as well as social difficulties, disruption in school, work, family life, getting access to care, and all of this I'll talk about in more detail later. It's estimated that a third of people with cancer experience ongoing significant psychosocial distress. And also caregivers and family members often report even higher levels of distress. There now is a body of evidence that shows that the deleterious effects of not receiving psychosocial support and the benefits of quality of life for those that do. And that failure to address this these problems can result in needless suffering for patients and their families. And in some cases, it can even obstruct the quality of health care, like not missing appointments, and potentially affect the course of the disease. It was only, um, and I don't know how old my audience is, <laughs> I am certainly old enough to remember that before the 1970s, Cancer was just a very frightening word. People thought of cancer and they thought of death. And you can imagine how scary that was for patients. And very often patients were not even told their diagnosis. It was considered cruel and inhumane that they would give up hope if they knew. So patients were stigmatized and patients were ashamed and kept cancer a secret. And also there was you know, an, a, an attitude toward mental illness and psychological issues. And there were fears and negative attitudes and stigma toward getting help. And, you know, the psychological issues were undervalued. Basic scientists felt that they didn't have the tools to really do any research on patient self-reporting of what they felt like. It was considered not measurable and unreliable. So it's kind of like a touchy-feely um, branch of science. And there was also, whoops, it was also the mind-body patient connection that put an extra burden on patients. You must have wanted to have cancer. You must think positive to beat cancer. I'm sure that some of you know about the tyranny of positive thinking, that only if you had thought more positively. Depression can make your tumor grow. Stress causes cancer. Some of these still persist today. In fact, I don't know, again, if you remember that when Jacqueline Onassis died, there were headlines about that a lifetime of tragedy caused her fatal cancer. But then the barriers began to be reduced in the 1970s. Cancer kind of came out of the closet. There were more cancer survivals who revealed their diagnosis, like Abby Rockefeller, Betty Ford, who had had mastectomies. There were women's and patients' rights movement who felt that they needed better care. They were all, there were open debates about telling patients their diagnosis and just a general new optimism about curative therapies. And in 1977, the, full, the first full-time psychiatric service was started at Sloan Kettering. So for the first time, they actually began to look into quantitative tools for the assessment of emotional issues. Also, there was a report issued from the National, um, from the, actually the Institute of Medicine, which said that the psychosocial domain must be integrated into routine cancer care. And the international report that came out in 2010 that actually said that they should have a sixth vital sign of distress, that when a cancer patient came in, they should actually monitor that so that if needed, they could get them support. So now there is evidence base for efficacious intervention for distressed patients. It's not just touchy-feely anymore. And there are practical clinical guidelines. And no longer is psychosocial care viewed as something um, separate and apart. And this is a very important advance for patients living with cancer. It's now recognized and validated that how a patient feels, how that is supported, whether by professionals or by a better understanding of the patient experience by, and by the patient and by those who love them and care for them, 
that it's just as important to understand this as the chemotherapies they receive. This ease of suffering and the isolation that cancer patients can feel. So let's move on now to the what is the emotional experience of a cancer patient? What are their issues? Well, when one looks at a cancer patient's experience, it's not a simple question. Yes, there are basic overall reactions such as anxiety, depression, but emotional reactions can vary with where the patient is in the disease process. Each part of the cancer spectrum has its own issues. The onset, when one gets the diagnosis, the shock, the fear, the disbelief, there can be anxiety, depression, sadness, mourning of life that they had before. Then immediately having to go into treatment, symptom management, feeling tired, having pain, just feeling lousy, recovery from surgery. Then there is a point at which one finishes chemotherapy. There may be no evidence of disease. So a patient should be jumping up and down. But actually, at that point, there's kind of a fear that they're no longer doing anything to the cancer and that they're done with therapy, but now they're unprotected. They also don't have the social support of the clinic where they used to go you know, every week or every couple of weeks. They can, a panic can set in. There can be a hypochondriasis, every little ache, oh my gosh, my cancer's coming back. There also can be a PTSD type of reaction, which when you go through something as traumatic, is getting diagnosed and then treated with cancer. You put one foot in front of another, you get through it. And then, a few months after, all of a sudden, it, it hits you what you really went through. And this is unexpected for patients. And it's also unexpected for those around them who expect the patient, OK, great, you're OK now. Let's get on with things. Then there is the recurrence, advanced disease stage where it can be more of a crisis than the original diagnosis. A fear of death, a pessimism, a loss of hope, a loss of faith, anger, and any kind of denial can be shattered. And then the terminal phase of the illness where the patient needs to deal with the existential issues that all of us have, but those are right in front of the patient to have to deal with. So what are the stresses of the cancer patient? Let's break it down um, in the limited time we have. I'll list these. We can certainly discuss some of them further on in the Q&A. But this list is intended to emphasize how much stress can result from the cancer. It touches every aspect of people's lives. There's a stress from relationships. Um, communication, how do you talk with people about what you're going through? Who do you tell? Then the issue of dependence. If you've always been independent, led your own life, all of a sudden now you have to depend on other people and that can be very hard. There's disruption at work. Whether or not you continue work during treatment, probably at a lower level, or whether you have to stop work altogether. And family life, and I'll talk more about this later. The changing of roles in family life. There can be stress from the physical aspects of the illness itself, um, having to deal with the adverse events from chemo. There's difficulties in accessing care. All of a sudden, here you are. You've been told, oh, you've got to go to radiation therapy every day for six weeks. Well, there's just some logistical aspects. How do you arrange all of that? Then, if the person with cancer is the breadwinner in the family, there's financial stress. And then just stress from facing, as I mentioned before, the existential issues. What are the symptoms that come from all these stresses? It's, patients can just be overwhelmed by fears to the point of panic or just an overpowering sense of dread that they just can't shake. 
there's anxiety from not knowing what the future will bring. I think this is one of the hardest things that cancer patients deal with as well as their families. No one can give you a straight answer. You ask the, the doctor, okay, what's going to happen when I get this chemotherapy? What are the chances that you know it's going to help me? Well, there's 20% chance of this and well, we've seen 70% chance. If you don't have any, um, any really sense of what is going to happen, and that's very hard. Feeling so sad, you know, that it's really hard to motivate yourself to go through treatment. Difficulty coping with the pain, fatigue, the nausea, and other adverse reactions to therapy. And unusual irritability anger. Maybe it's something you're, you're not used to being irritable. But just going through this whole process can produce um, frustration, which results in irritability. And one of the ones starting to get a lot of recognition now is poor concentration, sudden memory problems. And it's referred to as chemo brain. And it's still unclear which chemotherapies produce it, when it happens, how long people experience it. But it is something that's receiving a lot of attention. But it's very hard for patients to cope with that. And then there are decisions that need to be made throughout the course of treatment. And it can be very hard sometimes to make these decisions. There's a general feeling of despair, of hopelessness, wondering if there's any point in continuing with treatment. The anxiety and depression of constant thoughts about the cancer, trouble sleeping, trouble eating, and just sometimes an overall feeling of worthlessness because before you used to be able to contribute and you felt you were you know worthwhile and what you were doing in your life at your work at your family and now you may have a feeling that you're useless so when one looks across the spectrum that I've described the common feelings of the cancer patients anxiety depression, extreme sadness, fear, anger, helplessness, and a sense of isolation. I want to just mention anger because I think that's something very hard to deal with, not only for the patient but also for the caregivers and family. The patients can cope by ventilating anger and in a way sometimes it can be a healthy way. They can vent at the medical system, at the disease, the treatment, just their life that's so out of control. But it can be very difficult if you are the target. And the first reaction can be to act very defensively. But just to take a deep breath, step back, and have a more empathetic response is really at the core of being able to be really loving to the patient. The other Issues that stand out to me, the loss and grief, I think, is something very difficult um, and maybe hard for other people to understand because life will never be like it was before cancer. And um, everything in your life, your work, relationships, mobility, physical appearance, all of those can be changed, either temporarily or forever. And then again, the existential issues that, I, that I've raised. So what are the styles of coping that, um, that one can see in cancer patients? Um, there can be a fighting spirit. Um, there can also be just a sense of total helplessness of really needing people around you to, um, to help you with all of the decisions and logistics that you have to do. Some just accept it very stoically and there also is an acceptance that's supported by spiritual and religious beliefs which can be very helpful to patients. There also can be denial and avoidance and true denial is rare. It's more likely denial of the emotional impact of the illness. Denial can actually have an adaptive function. I think if people understand 
what is going on, that they have cancer and they need to have it treated, but they choose not to discuss it. They just don't want to have cancer as part of their everyday life. And it may appear to others as if they're in denial, but actually it's a healthy way for them to get some relief from the anxiety and depression and sadness that they feel. In some cases, of course, it can be maladaptive if a patient's unable to um, continue with their treatment and the necessary planning that they need to do. And that's something to be on the lookout for. Again, there are emotional profiles you can see in patients, and this can be really helpful for those who are caring for cancer patients or who are around them to really not react too much um, to them and to respect how a patient is able to cope with what they're going through. A patient can be overly demanding. They may very much need attention. They can cut off. They can just be very silent. They can just not get a handle on the distress. They're just, they just act out being distressed, not able to make decisions, and they can not want help. Um, they can be very stubborn about not wanting help, and that can be very hard for people who are there. So cancer not only affects cancer patients, it affects the extended family. There can actually be differences in, within the family in the coping styles that I've talked about, and that can create tension. There can be a, a conspiracy of silence where there's the elephant in the room, but nobody wants to talk about it, and the cancer patient can feel like they can't bring it up, and it can cre also create um, tension. Changing roles, which I alluded to earlier, you know, someone is used to cleaning the house, preparing the meals, doing the shopping, that kind of thing. If that person is the one affected by cancer, someone's going to have to do that. That puts extra stress on the other person who may be the person who is working and will have extra, an extra burden on them. And then, of course, if the person who has cancer can't work and it does create financial concerns for everyone in the family. Overall, the concern is when these stress reactions interfere with the patient's ability to cope or weaken their ability to adhere to treatment. Um, and this is when one may consider getting some outside help for the patient. And that's basically what psychoontology is there for. So in summary, patients living with cancer are a unique population with very specific challenges. I think just to summarize, I think the three most difficult ones are the uncertainties they face with treatment results, with unknown prognosis, the profound emotional and physical impact of the diagnosis as well as the medical treatment, and the changing emotional response to a variety of disease settings and changes throughout the cancer experience. Understanding these reactions can help normalize them so patients do not feel so alone. It can also help their caregivers and loved ones to understand their experience better and be able to support them more effectively. How can these emotions be handled? How can we help patients cope? I will now turn the podium over to Ali Schaefer who will discuss these challenging topics. Thank you so much, Dr. Harvey, for a very informative presentation. Uh, now I'd like to go ahead and introduce our next speaker, Ali Schaefer. Ali is the manager of patient and family-centered care at the Vanderbilt Ingram Cancer Center, where she oversees the management of the Patient and Family Resource Center, Clinic Volunteers, Pet Therapy, and the Vanderbilt Oncology Expressive Arts Committee. Her special interests include increasing patient and caregiver education within the healthcare setting and addressing the psychosocial needs of people living with cancer through creative and interactive programs. Thank you again for joining us today, Allie. 
Thank you, everybody. I'm thrilled to be on this talk today, and we have so much continued rich information to cover. Thank you to uh, Dr. Harvey for really providing a beautiful historical overview of psychooncology and how it's come to be where we are today, and also an in-depth look at the individual emotional responses to a cancer diagnosis, because it sets the scene for what I'm going to talk about, which is how how to cope with all of these things, and I'm also going to give you some food for thought. Much of what you're going to hear today has been gathered from my most significant and important teachers, which are the numerous patients and families I've interacted with who have been touched by cancer over the years I've worked in oncology care. Some of what you're going to hear today may resonate with you, some of it may not resonate at all, and that's okay. This is simply food for thought. It's opportunities for you to consider making some changes in your coping strategies and how you're coping with cancer, regardless of where you're at along the cancer care continuum. This is all good information for you to consider how you can put it into play today. And with that, I encourage you not to try to do it all at once, but to maybe pick something, see how it works, to try something else, see how it works. This is an ever-changing process, and again, this is a place to start. This is not necessarily an end, just the beginning. So I want to take a moment just to highlight some of the different coping strategies. It's important to remember that people cope differently in life and with cancer. I think there is this perception and this kind of subtle shift or maybe not so subtle shift that happens when people have cancer, everything else goes out the window. So some of what has been useful to you coping in past events and scenarios in your life can also be coping and useful in coping with cancer. So just to note, and these are generalizations, and it's not to say this is the rule or this is how it applies to you, but many women are tending and befriending as a coping style, and men oftentimes are solo and alone and escape through an activity as far as their coping strategies. I like to approach the next part of the talk as to some empowering things that you can do. As you've all likely experienced, cancer can be incredibly overwhelming and many people feel out of control and at a loss and that is one of the most difficult things. So often cancer patients and families are asking, what can I do? How can I help myself? And so what we're going to look at today is some very practical tips and tools that you can do and implement easily and quickly to hopefully shift your ability to cope with the experience, again, regardless of where you're at in your cancer experience. Some of these things may sound very simple. Some of these things may sound very silly. Some of it is just that. It is simple and silly. But when you are stuck in the muck of your cancer experience, often you lose perspective. So this is also an opportunity for me to return some perspective to you to hopefully help you or your family members where you're at. So again, take what works for you and let the rest go. One of the biggest, most important tools that I can share with you is communication. Let's go back for a moment. It's communication. So I want to talk about your personal communication, and then I also have a, a call out with specifically the healthcare team, because how patients and families communicate with the healthcare team is an incredibly, part, incredibly important part of coping with cancer. Many people feel overwhelmed and intimidated in the medical setting or in the medical environment, and so thinking about this as a very important part of coping with cancer can help you to feel like a more empowered part of your healthcare team and more a part of what's happening to you. Um, and so this can be a key thing to look at. 
So it's really okay to be selective about who and how you share your personal information. Many times people feel when they're diagnosed with cancer or when they have a loved one with cancer that they just have to tell everybody or conversely everybody asks questions and feels like it's their business. The reality is it is not everybody's business about your diagnosis. You can set boundaries in place about what you are willing to share and about what you're willing to receive as far as advice or stories or treatment cures, all of the things that you've likely experienced at the time of a new diagnosis or recurrence or end of life or any point in time where something changes in your trajectory. You also might find that not everybody can do cancer. Um, I hear the experience that many patients and families talk about the people they thought were their friends or the people they thought were close to them disappeared at the onset of a cancer diagnosis and that can be incredibly hurtful and yet conversely there are some people who they didn't know very well that stepped up and have now become very important in their life and in their coping experience. Discussing all of your feelings. Dr. Harvey alluded to this. It is incredibly important to discuss all of your feelings, not just imply or assume that you can only talk about the good stuff. Cancer is real. Cancer is impacting every aspect of your life. Some days you're going to have good days and some days you're going to have tough days. Having a difficult day, feeling down, feeling frustrated, feeling overwhelmed doesn't mean you're giving up. It just means you're having a day. And I think a lot of times friends and families aren't always able to hear that and just assume they've got to tell you to be positive. So discussing all of the feelings can be really important to just get it out and move on. Thinking as well about your preferred method of communication. Everybody has different styles. Some people like to talk a lot, some people not at all. So really just thinking about what your individual style is. And then moving on to the healthcare team. Thinking about all these things ahead of time. So again, you can be prepared in the healthcare setting. You can communicate effectively and clearly. And you can also retain information that's discussed during medical visits because it's very important. So I just want you to look through these and think about, are you doing these things? How could you do them better? And what are some things that you could start to implement next time you go to the medical uh, setting? Some food for thought, again, these are just some practical ways to implement the empowering sea of communication. What do I want and need my healthcare team to know? Do I have an inner, inner circle of people I feel most comfortable sharing with? And what feels important for people to understand? Do I want to tell them everything? Do I want to tell them nothing? And even what expectations do I have of myself about how I communicate and how effectively or how often? The next empowering C, which I am a huge proponent of, um, in fact, I'm a licensed clinical social worker, but so that's my lean and that's kind of my bias, that I know the work that we do that can be incredibly important. So many people are hesitant or fearful of enlisting professional help because they're afraid of what it might mean or because someone might think they're crazy or something's wrong with them. Cancer is a very complicated experience and it's not always intuitive as to how to cope with it. So sometimes it is very important and effective to call in professional support to address some of these very specific life events that can help provide a safe space to listen without judgment and normalize your feelings. Oftentimes what you're feeling is incredibly normal, but because you're the only one that's feeling it and it's new for you, it feels overwhelming and scary and very uncomfortable. And so a professional person can help to normalize that, can help to teach you coping skills, and can also provide co crisis intervention as needed. Many people don't know, but professional support related to a cancer experience can often be short-term support. It doesn't mean forever and ever more, but it can just be a couple of sessions where you can get some really effective, important work done that will carry you forward. Creativity, this is a good one. Oftentimes, we're so overwhelmed in the midst of cancer and we're trying to think about how to do and what to do. So finding new and different ways to solve problems, to create safe space for emotions, to make time for fun, this is huge. You can have fun while living with cancer. Um, thinking about trying new things and instituting some healthy habits. Many of you have probably received recommendations from your medical team to make some healthy changes in your 
life for ongoing support or to help you stay invested and involved with cancer treatments. So thinking about how you can do new and healthy habits that don't feel overwhelming and like chores or homework. Some food for thought with creativity. How can I create a cancer-free zone? Yes, it is possible. You can have an hour a week or an hour a day where you set it up with friends, families, loved ones, where it's we're not talking about cancer. Sometimes that can be very awkward at the beginning because that's all you're thinking about and feeling. So if you just sit and stare at each other for an hour, that's fine. But beginning the practice of creating some space outside of cancer helps to remind you of who you are before cancer and helps you to stay connected to the parts of yourself that will likely help you cope and have a day-to-day -day normal life that feels good for you. It can also be important to use creativity to think about new solutions. I'm having nausea in the morning and I need to eat food with my medication. How can I be creative to make this happen? Starting a gratitude journal or practice, there is so much now about the impact and the power of gratitude. So just thinking about that. It doesn't need to be hard or overwhelming it. Just making a list. I feel happy today that I did not have any headaches. I feel happy today that I was able to work my full eight hour day. I am grateful that I walked to the mailbox to get my mail today. So really thinking about those simple things and shifting what your focus is. Curiosity. We all know and love Curious George. Um, and yes, he got into lots of trouble, but he also got to have a lot of adventures because of his curiosity. So thinking about and being curious, how am I coping? How have others coped? What is working for me and not working for me? Being able to get curious about patterns so you can say, wow, I'm really fatigued by 3 o'clock every day, so how can I change my schedule to accommodate that? Looking ahead at how your schedule might change. I'm switching from having chemotherapy every month to having chemotherapy every six months, or I'm now only going back to follow up once a year. What does this look like? And then how are you going to communicate this information with the people that it matters or can help to support you through these changes in process? Even being curious about the ways in which you've grown from this experience. Food for thought, again, the curiosity of what I've learned about myself, what I'm proud of. How can I organize my day to accommodate symptoms? Being curious about how and what I need to prepare myself to return back to work full time. So thinking about what's kind of creating some challenges or barriers for you and how can you use some curiosity and creative problem solving. Clarification. This is a very important C. Um, many people just kind of keep doing what they've been doing without giving space, time, and permission to acknowledge that things may be different. Um, either because of the cancer diagnosis, because of a new phase in your cancer care continuum, ending treatment, starting a new treatment, returning back to work. And so it can be important to revisit some things and clarify them, to think about finances, reviewing priorities, what is important today and how can I change what matters to me to get those things done. Knowing your strengths and your limitations. Clarifying personal goals or family goals. A lot of times people don't talk about these things and this is where they get tripped up in the details because it's what they're thinking about. So being able to talk and communicate is really important. Discussing a care plan with the healthcare team. This is also an important point of clarification because what you might be anticipating or assuming may be very different from what's going to happen. So using the care team to clarify what's next can be a great source of comfort and empowerment. Um, again, thinking about some of these things for clarification and, and how can I use the details and knowledge that I have to make some things work for me. I got really clear that having fresh food and listening to music make me feel good. How can I incorporate that every day into my life? Consistency. This is another incredibly important um, C, and it's about regaining routine. Oftentimes, cancer throws your routine and schedule into chaos, and so it's about how can I achieve and regain some form of routine. And it's not 
to say that it's going to look exactly the same as it did before your cancer diagnosis because your needs, your tasks, and your wants have changed. So just how can I gain some consistency so it can also help my body just to know this is what's going to happen and, and getting into a routine that feels comfortable. Um, how can we create consistent communication patterns? You know, whether it's I'm going to email and update people once a month or once a week um, about what's going on so I don't have to deal with the everyday, multiple times a day communication of what's happening. And then consistent routine self-care. This is so, so important. Taking care of yourself, all parts of yourself, really sets you up through this process. Again, food for thought of consistency. Just what can I do so it becomes automatic and I don't have to keep thinking about game planning and problem solving every detail of every day. I think having some consistency also helps our brains and our bodies relax a little bit because you just have routine. Um, the Sesame Street, the people in our neighborhood, this is a huge one. We often forget about what's already embedded in our community. And community is a lot of things. Community is where you live, where you work. It can also now, with the power of technology, be what's online and what's in the, um, the web. Uh, as we know right now, we have all these people from all over the place that are gathering for this purpose of information and education and support. So this is meeting a need for a lot of you. So taking the time to think about who's in your community. Is there a cancer support group that I want to join? Again, utilizing the resources we have on hand today, Inspire, Fight CRC, Debbie's Dream Foundation, all of these are great resources that don't force you to leave your home. So if you're dealing with side effects or symptoms, or if weather is an issue, you can still access and connect to meaningful support that will be helpful. Some additional thoughts of community is kind of how can I utilize existing services to meet my needs. Um, now that I'm in a different place in treatment, I want to get back to the gym and I'm not really sure what I can and can't do as far as physical activity. So who could I talk to that will help me to know what is safe for me to do again? A lot of times people get really focused on looking for cancer only support and I often will help people think about what's already in your environment, in your community that you can tap into and then, you know, maybe it's a yoga class. Well, how do I know if they're good for people who have cancer? Well, go talk to them and see what they can do and how they can support you. It might involve a little bit of pre-work or education for that provider or for that service and most people are more than willing to do those kind of things. Healthy living practices, this is really important and I'm not going to have time to elaborate on all these but I really want you to look at this list. Each one of these practices is incredibly important and there is growing evidence based information and research happening about the impact on quality of life, decrease on symptoms of each of these practices. So. This might be a place to start. I'm interested in meditation. Going online and finding a meditation YouTube video can be a great thing to do. Um, and just what feels good and doing more of that. If you try something and it doesn't feel good, try something different. Some additional healthy living strategies that sometimes feel, again, simple or out of reach. Getting a good night's sleep is hugely important to overall health and well-being. And sometimes that can be really difficult. So that might be a place to go in and talk to your healthcare provider about what you can do to get a good night's sleep. And it might be a multi-factorial um, and, and multi-system uh, intervention as to how that's going to happen. The bottom part of this, the periodically assess and evaluate your needs. Again, your needs are going to change over time. What you need on day one is not going to be what you need on day 365, so don't keep doing the same thing. You've got to periodically reorganize, reprioritize, redefine, recommit, and then reinvest. It's this beautiful cycle loop that you keep seeing what's happening, what you need, what's not working, what is working, and just kind of feedback that loop 
and sometimes it's just really important to come back to the basics which sometimes is the hardest thing for people impacted by cancer because you are so used to functioning at such a high complex multitasking level on every single day that to come back to very simple basics feels like you're taking a hundred thousand steps back and sometimes that's exactly what's needed so you can move forward this, I'll be honest, is one of my favorite slides that I figured out how to get a professional presentation that includes cheese dip. So this is a very important empowering C. I realized over time in my life that sometimes all that helps is just a big vat of cheese dip. So some days, it doesn't happen often, but some days I'm just having one of those phases in my life where I just need to call a friend who won't judge if I need to eat the whole cheese dip by myself, and I can go and sit and talk. So while your thing might not be cheese dip, I encourage you to think about what is your one thing that you're going to give yourself that every time without fail, it just feels good because sometimes you need that. You need something without judgment, without repercussions that you can do and just to take care of yourself, to laugh, to smile, to feel good, to let go, to disconnect, whatever the thing is. So I encourage you to think about your thing that's really going to help you just get through that next phase or get through that really difficult part. Things to remember, there is no right or wrong way to cope with cancer. I hear so many people with the shoulds, I should do this, I should do that, I shouldn't do this, I should feel this way, and it becomes a just big ball of wax. What works is what works for you and that's it, and what works right now might not work this afternoon. Communication is key and nobody is a mind reader. <laughs> although we often want people to be mind readers. Being willing to ask for help, which I know is a hugely difficult thing, and when you're in the midst of cancer, it's often the last thing that you want to do, but it can be a really important experience. Self-care is key. Being honest even when it's hard and uncomfortable is very important. And I said this before, but your needs will change over time. Let them. And then the beauty of this all, you can always try again tomorrow. So if today was a really hard and bad day and things just weren't working, let it go and try again tomorrow. And I think at this point, um, I'll turn it back over so we can do questions. Thank you. I know we've run through so much information, and we're here for questions. Thank you so much, Ali, for an excellent presentation. Um, and if you want to learn more about some of our different cancer communities, um, any of you can learn more by visiting cancer.inspire.com. And now we want to give everybody a chance to ask their questions if they haven't already um, using the questions function in the control panel. And we realize we might not have enough time to answer all questions today. We will be sending out uh, not only a recording of the program later this week, we will also be sending directions on how you can submit additional questions, um, whether you don't get your questions answered today or you think of a question after this program. We'll be posting a discussion on INSPIRE in both the Fight Colorectal Cancer and the Debbie Stream Foundation support communities, and we'll send a link to those discussions. If, you, if you're not a member of INSPIRE, you can join INSPIRE and post your questions, and we'll, we will be sharing those with our speakers. So um, check your inbox for that email to come in the next few days. And I'm going to go ahead and start with our first question which is, um, I find it frustrating to communicate with some friends and family who think you are cured once you finish frontline treatment, and if you look good. Getting them to understand the emotional toll is tough. I feel like I have to keep repeating. Is this just something I have to accept? And I will go ahead and open up um, both speakers' microphones, and feel free to chime in. Um, yeah, so this is an excellent question, and this is something that I've heard repeatedly, and I imagine Dr. Harvey has as well. Um, people assume that when cancer treatment stops, that's the end of the cancer experience, and yet the cancer patient is often left still in the midst, still in chaos, still trying to regroup and move forward. And so 
my response to that is communication you know but practicing and thinking ahead of time about what you want to say you might not need to say everything to everybody but there might be some key people in your life that you want to have that pointed conversation to say to them I am done with treatment and I am still in the midst of processing this all and recovering and it's going to take me some time so I'm asking you to have patience with me to know this is still happening for me so however you want to say it that feels good to you um, and to, to think about it ahead of time but this is a very common experience for people and it comes down to communication and helping people to know what it means to you. I think also um, what's very hard for patients is that they don't expect it. You know, so when when they're you know six months past treatment or whatever, and they're feeling like this, when someone says something to them, it makes them feel like, oh wow, I should be better. I should be doing this. So I think it, you know, for that reason also, it's very hard. But I think that Ali's suggestion, you know, is just lies at the heart of the issue is, first of all, really understanding that what you're going through is very normal, that you're not crazy and there's nothing wrong with the fact that you feel that way, and then figuring out who you want to be able to kind of stop bugging you, like, you know, get up and go on, you know, which, which happens and it can be very difficult. Thank you very much. Uh, another question. I liked Allie's suggestion about a cancer-free zone. Does she have any stats on how receptive this is? Do friends find this a challenge? I don't have any stats. This is just something um, that I've talked to a lot of people about and put into practice and heard from people that it's really important. And yes, people find it a challenge because that might be all that they can think about. So it can take practice and setting up some boundaries and guidelines ahead of time. Like if you're going to invite a friend for coffee to say, hey, I'm trying something new. I'm trying to create some, some space for myself outside of cancer. So are you willing to help me with it? I'd love to go grab coffee with me and here are some guidelines. I don't want to talk about cancer. I don't want to talk about how I'm feeling. Can you help me do this? And just to kind of set it up up front and to know it might be really hard and you might not get it right the first time, but being willing to try again. Great. Another question, how to cope with the uncertainty of phase one clinical trials? Boy, that's a, that's a tough question. Um, you know, for for the audience, phase one clinical trials are the very first time that a drug is put into humans. And the major purpose of a phase one trial is to actually test for adverse events. And what normally happens is they start out at a low dose and then they increase till they get to a point where they see more than are acceptable and then they back up to find a dose before going on to um, to therapy trials. So obviously they are only testing drugs that have potential. So for a cancer patient to make the decision about going into that trial, that there's no previous data in terms of how effective it is. So they're taking a risk, but again, it could, one never knows um, what will happen. So so I think it, it presents a dilemma. I think the other piece of it is that they normally um, enroll patients in clinical trials who have relatively advanced disease. So that a lot of times it can be seen as, um, you know, well, this is the only thing more that I can do. And so I think it has to be really evaluated whether the anticipated effects are going to um, affect the quality of life of the patient. So it's something that needs to be discussed um, in detail with the physician as well as with your family in terms of making that decision. I hope that Thank was you, Dr. Harvey. How do you cope with the reality that your cancer is not curable but treatable? That is until you run out of treatments. Survival based on extending life by always looking for new treatments because when one treatment stops working, you need another. What is the question? Let me uh, repeat that. 
How do you cope with the reality that your cancer is not... I'm oh, sorry? Go ahead. I didn't hear it at the beginning. Um, How do you cope with the reality that your cancer is not curable but treatable? That is until you run out of treatments. Survival based on extending life by always looking for new treatments because when one treatment stops working, you need another. That's also a very difficult question. I think in this day and age, where there's so much research being done in cancer that, that there are a variety of treatments. For example, in breast cancer, the biology of breast cancer has essentially changed because there's so many alternatives that when a patient becomes resistant to one treatment that they can have several others to, to go to. There does come a point where there may not be another drug specifically that can be tried. However, patients should never feel that there's nothing that can be done for them. There is a whole process of palliative medicine, of taking care of patients and having them without pain and feeling comfortable at that particular time of the cancer process. So I think that um, for the cancer patient to cope with that, first of all, just to have an understanding of the process, and then just, you know, for themselves to um, be able to accept the fact that, um, you know, that they will not be able to um, continue treatment for forever and to come to acceptance of that. But it's hard. In addition, there is also a shift of focus. So if someone is going to be on treatment for the rest of their life and they found a pretty good rhythm and flow with it, they can also shift focus to quality of life. How can I become re-engaged in my day, to li day life? What are some priorities that are important to me to make sure are happening? So sometimes because you have a consistent routine of treatment, albeit you have that kind of worry um, in the front and sometimes side of your brain about when might it stop working, you can also be working to have full quality of life, which sometimes falls to the wayside when you're in the acute intensity of some of the treatment. So I think using some of the tools that we talked about today to shift focus to have life and quality of life can also be really important because having treatment for the end of your life and living with metastatic disease does not mean what it used to mean. There are people that live full lives, happy lives, have a lot um, of work, life, family, even while they're having treatment. Thank you. Uh, we have a related question, and so I don't know if there's anything to add to what you just said. Uh, the question is how to cope with being told we would like to maintain your cancer. You have a maintainable cancer. Um, you know, I think it's some of what we just answered, and a lot of it is going back and, you know, it might be helpful to have more information from the medical team about what does that mean, what, do you, what does it look like, and then what does that mean more specifically for me, and what can I do to take care of myself to maintain this, because maintaining a cancer could be six months, that could be 60 years. So I think depending upon the specificities of that case, it might mean really different things as to how to cope with it. But getting information, acknowledging the reality of the situation, and engaging all of the different coping mechanisms we've talked about can be really helpful to shift it into something that feels doable and workable and can actually create meaning and value to your life. And I think that Ali did an excellent presentation of ways to do that. And I think, again, just one quick notice that I find is, you know, the real challenge for the cancer patient is when they do have a cancer that can be cured and they know they're going to continue to be treated, it's finding a way to live their life every day, even in the, you know, with the knowledge that they're going to, of the unknown, which is, again, what I mentioned before, is one of the hardest things. And somehow to be able to put that out of your mind and just focus on what you can do every day. And Ali gave a lot of ideas for that. Um, you know, it's, it's a way to proceed, but it's not easy. 
not easy. Thank you, Dr. Harvey. Unfortunately, we're out of time. I know there were a couple more questions that we just weren't able to get to. But again, I want to thank Dr. Harvey, Ali, and our partners for joining us today and for all their hard work on this program. Uh, we will, again, be sending a recording of the program to everyone who registered by email in the next few days. And we will also be sending links to discussions in the Fight Colorectal Cancer and Debbie's Dream Foundation Curing Stomach Cancer Communities. So you can continue to ask questions. We will make sure that we answer as many questions as we can on, on, on Inspire on behalf of our speakers. Thanks again, and hope you enjoy the rest of your day.